Hello and welcome to the Monday, October 8, 2018 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I am recording from Honolulu, Hawaii. Just a quick update on the Bloomberg story regarding the rogue chips that allegedly were found on Supermicro motherboards. We have a few more denials of the story, including Department of Homeland Security did publish a press release stating that they're not aware of any implants like this. On the other hand, Bloomberg reconfirmed that even in light of all of these denials that they're standing by their story. So really hard to tell. Again, don't panic. I wouldn't go in and rip apart all of your servers. If this story is true, then likely only very specific organizations were targeted with these malicious chips. Well, it was about a year ago that Matthew Van Hoef did find the crack attack in WPA2 and well uh, with WPA3 on the horizon now, Matthew did publish an update about his work about weaknesses in WPA2. What he found is that there are a couple ways how mitigation of the crack attack is lagging. For example, WNM, the wireless network management feature, which is a power save feature that you find a lot in mobile devices and such can be used to bypass some of the crack countermeasures. Secondly, also some of the patches being deployed have been deficient and not really addressing the entire crack problem. Now, the patches have been improved and OS 10, for example, was an example here. So if you're up to date, you should be okay. He also showed how a new feature and that's fills or the fast initial link setup can be used in order to again, get back to the crack attack. However, this particular feature has only been finalized in June of 2017 and hasn't really shown up yet in hardware. This feature is also more for direct contact between clients, so probably not such a big issue at this point. In short, sometime next year, WPA3 should be arriving in the form of hardware. So uh, we'll see what this will do. This should prevent the crack attack and should in general make WPA more secure and also in some cases more usable. So we'll see what attacks people will come up with once this new standard is actually being used in the wild. And late last week, Cisco also released another set of updates. They're fixing 26 different vulnerabilities. The critical ones are a remote code execution vulnerability in Cisco's prime infrastructure. That's due to a permission issue and essentially an attacker can upload arbitrary files via TFTP and then execute them. The second one is actually two critical vulnerabilities in DNA Center. An attacker could access a number of critical management functions without authentication. There are also uh, two static credential vulnerabilities being addressed here. Now, they're just rated as high, not as critical. One in prime collaboration provisioning, and then there's a second one affecting the signing key in Hyperflex. And Seattle police is trying a new system to help with swatting. Swatting refers to someone placing a fake 911 call in order to direct an emergency response to someone else's house. Typically, they're indicating some form of violent crime like an armed robbery or something like that. And these emergency calls have caused real harm in the past, even in some cases with people getting killed. So what Seattle police is doing is is that you can register your address as an address where you think that you are under a higher exposure of possibly being swatted. And if now someone calls in an emergency to your location, then the emergency response still happens. So nothing is being slowed down. 
but the dispatcher will share the information with the responding officers telling them that you registered your address as a potential swatting victim. We'll see how this will all work out now if you have been the victim of swatting in the past or if you have been threatened with swatting and this often happens in online games and the like, then I would definitely get in touch with your local police department to see if they have a similar system. Can't hurt if responding officers are aware that the call may potentially be fake. Seattle is very explicit in that it will not slow down the response, but of course a responding officer may double check or so when they arrive to make sure that it's not a fake call. And then we got another vulnerability in Git that was fixed. Uh, this vulnerability would allow potential remote code execution if you are checking out a malicious Git repository. This vulnerability is due to the way Git deals with submodules. Submodules are additional projects, modules that you may want to include in a particular Git repository that you're checking out. And as part of the .git modules file, you specify URLs where these submodules can be found. Now, Git does allow the retrieval of modules via SSH. Problem with SSH is that SSH actually does allow allow the execution of commands as you're connecting to the remote system and this option is being exploited here. So to exploit this, a victim would have to check out a git repository that contains this malicious .git modules file. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.